I think we're off to uh, should be chapter eight, I think. And we're going to start talking about gases. Uh, obviously, we're going to talk about gas laws in this chapter. Uh, we'll talk about some gas laws that, again, uh, you're probably familiar with. We may cover some gas laws that maybe uh, you might not have been familiar with and some other sort of aspects of gases here. This, again, should be the uh, last chapter of the material that will be on our next exam. Uh, coming up again, that was moved, I believe, a week back. So uh, this should be the last stuff that's on there. All right, so let us uh, get going on this. Um, <clears throat> so first off, let us talk about gases and uh, some substances that is sort of exist as gases under normal conditions. Um, as we hopefully know, right, when we're talking about the gas phase, uh, we're really dealing with a state of matter well, where everybody has pretty much sort of broken apart from one another. Uh, they're free from each other. They're flying around. Uh, they contain usually a, a good amount of energy because of that. Uh, they also takes a good amount of energy, obviously, to get into the gas phase. As they're flying around, right, when we think about gases, as they're flying around, there are a lot of collisions that occur. Uh, collisions with the gas molecules in the container, for example, uh, causing pressure that we associate with obviously gases. So when we talk about sort of guys that exist as gases under normal conditions, let's just talk about sort of what normal conditions are. When we talk about normal conditions, uh, we're kind of talking almost like room temperature conditions, kind of everyday conditions. And that usually refers to a pressure of one ATM. ATM, as we'll talk about, is an atmosphere and that is a unit of pressure um, and also 25 degrees Celsius. So, you know, if you ever look in sort of tables type values um, in 200B or look at things like delta H, delta S, delta G, those type of things, thermodynamic values or just values in general, you know, when we sort of talk about a kind of normal temperature you know, the kind of everyday room temperature, we usually think about 25 degrees as being sort of a, a normal sort of temperature. And under these conditions of sort of one atmosphere and 25 degrees Celsius, we really don't find ionic compounds uh, in the gas state. And that's because ionic compounds, as we know from talking about bonding, they are held together by these really strong electrostatic forces, right? And that's really our forces between our positive guy and our negative guy, right? It's the attraction between those two charged uh, sort of particles. <clears throat> and one thing about electrostatic forces that hold together an ionic compound, they're what are sometimes referred to as intramolecular forces. And as the name sort of implies, intramolecular forces means within a molecule, the force that holds it together. So because when we're dealing with some type of ionic compound, we're looking at their sort of electrostatic attraction, which is that intramolecular force, that's a very strong force. And under normal conditions, it would take a, an incredible amount of energy to try to get those things to sort of break apart from each other. It really doesn't typically happen with ionic compounds. Usually with ionic compounds, we think more of it starting to melt. So for example, we just a uh, logical example, sodium chloride, salt, or something like that. Clearly, when we heat up something like sodium chloride, we don't really get it to go into the gas phase, which means we don't really get chlorine atoms flying around or sodium chloride ions flying around. You know, what usually will happen if you've ever, uh, for example, had salt water in an experiment maybe that you've done in the past in the chemistry lab, and you kind of uh, evaporate off all the water, you're left with a salty sort of residue that's left over. And if you continue to sort of heat that, typically what will happen is it'll just kind of look like it started to melt. It really will not break apart and start to go into the gas phase or anything like that. So with ionic compounds, because they're really held together by these really strong intramolecular forces, we really don't get those guys in sort of gas phases uh, very often or very normally. 
And that's very different than what we do sort of experience with molecular compounds or covalent compounds. So remember molecular compounds, covalent compounds. These are our guys that are essentially sharing electrons, right? So we have guys sharing electrons. So there are things that are sort of like gases just sort of right off the bat, uh, like carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, hydrogen chloride gas, ammonia, uh, CH4 is methane. But a vast majority of compounds are really liquids and solids at room temperature. But the major difference between say an ionic compound and sort of a molecular compound in terms of gases is it is usually much, much easier to convert a molecular compound into a gas than it is obviously an ionic compound. And why is that? Well, the very sort of simple example that we're all probably familiar with is we definitely can take something like water. Right? And we know water is normally found in the liquid state under normal conditions. And when we look at water, and when you get a couple of water sort of molecules together, because water is polar, it has a negative side on the oxygens. Hydrogens are more positive. Hydrogen is positive, oxygen is negative. What happens when we get a bunch of water molecules together is they are held together by what is referred to as hydrogen bonding here between the negative oxygen of one and the positive hydrogen of the other. Now, although hydrogen bonding is a relatively strong sort of force, it is nowhere near as strong as the intramuscular force or the um, electrostatic attraction. This type of bonding and this type of attraction between two water molecules, this is what is referred to as an intermolecular force. Intermolecular force, again, is the force that holds two different molecules together. And by different, I don't mean, um, let me spell that right there, molecules, there you go, together. Uh, by different, I, I don't mean necessarily mean that they can't be like two waters or something like that, but I mean two distinct sort of molecules, two of the same, two different molecules, whatever it may be, but two sort of molecules is basically the force that holds them together. And when we think about the intermolecular force, it is a much weaker force. So what happens when we heat something like water is, actually before we talk about that, we talk about just one water molecule by itself. When we talk about just one individual water molecule by itself, the bond between the oxygen and hydrogen on one side and the bond between the oxygen and hydrogen on the other side, that is what are known as intramolecular force. for a particular water molecule. So just like our ionic compounds, that's the force that holds an individual sort of molecule together. This sharing of electrons, covalent bonding is what this is, right? So these covalent bonds on each side is the intramolecular force. And what we know is intramolecular forces, these guys are always stronger than any intramolecular force. How do we know that? Well, a very simple example is when you heat up water to make pasta, you get steam, right? When it starts to boil, right? And that is basically water, H2O. You don't get hydrogen gas or oxygen gas because you probably won't get to the pasta part in that case. Uh, so what we know is when we start to heat something like water between the intramolecular force, which is the forces within the molecule and the intermolecular force, which is the forces that hold two different water molecules. When you start heating it, the very first bond that will break is right here between the two water molecules. And what you end up with is an intact water molecule and an intact water molecule here. And that's obviously what then gets converted into a steam basically, which is the gas version of water. If the opposite was true, and you would start heating it and the intramolecular force was weaker, basically these individual bonds would break. You would get hydrogen gas, oxygen gas, and probably have a very big mess at that point. So because molecular compounds 
one sort of compound and another are usually held together by these sort of weaker intermolecular forces. They're much easier to convert into the sort of the gas phase than something that's held together by only an intramolecular force, which is essentially what we see in an ionic compound. Any questions on that there? So some substances that are found as gases under normal conditions. Uh, some of these hopefully we're familiar with. A lot of those diatomic molecules that we talked about way back when, these are our hydrogen gas, oxygen gas, nitrogen gas, fluorine. Uh, these are our, right, our twos, right? They come as twos. That's how they naturally come. Ozone, which is O3, is also a gas. And then of course, our group eight, those are monoatomic uh, gases. Monoatomic basically means they come as ones, right? And that's our helium, our neon, our argon, our krypton, all of our ons there in group eight on the periodic table. And again here, that's pretty much these guys in blue along with hydrogen, which is hiding over here. And we got our kind of guys that are normally gases at room temperature. So what are some of the characteristics of gases? Uh, some of these you may be familiar with, but let's talk about a few of them here. Um, a gas is basically assumed to have, is basically assumed to basically take on the volume and shape of their containers. So if you think about sort of the basic definition of a gas is that it basically will fill the container uniformly. And that's because the gas is constantly flying around. So if it's constantly flying around, it's going to basically fill that container. As you could kind of see here in this guy right here, you could kind of see the gas kind of uniformly filling up the container, moving around basically in that particular volumetric flask. Gases are the most compressible state of matter, less mess than say when you try to compress liquid like water, right? It gets all over the place if you try to squeeze it down. Gases will mix evenly and completely when they're confined in the same container. Just by the process of what they are doing, they are constantly flying around, which means they are constantly mixing with each other. And because they're constantly mixing with each other, usually we say that you know gases are soluble in each other because they simply are flying around. One of the big things that we'll talk about kind of in this chapter and uh, sort of point out along the way is the idea of, you know, we oftentimes talk about an ideal gas. And one of the important things that makes something sort of an ideal gas is sort of that little spot right there. We can have multiple gases sort of flying around in the same container. They're mixing pretty equally and everything like that. Uh, but as we will see and talk about in this chapter, uh, they were, they're assumed that they are kind of not really interacting with each other. And that's sort of the idea of something that's an ideal gas, almost like they're in that container by themselves. They're not, but they are pretending to be almost in there by themselves. Now, densities do have lower, uh, gases do have lower densities than liquids and solids. So typically when we think about densities of liquids and solids, we usually think about units of grams per milliliter or grams per cubic centimeter, remembering that a milliliter is the same as a cubic centimeter. When we talk about gases in terms of density, the density of a gas is usually grams per liter. So those are very common units that we use when we're dealing with that sort of density of a gas grams per liter versus, again, our uh, grams per milliliter or grams per cubic centimeter that we commonly sort of deal with. So as these gas molecules are flying around, obviously, as we're having collisions, we're going to end up with pressure associated with. So let's talk a little about some really common units of good talk, talk a little bit more about it. Uh, good common units of pressure that we do come across. Pressure is basically force uh, over area there. Uh, so a couple of different units that we see, a pascal or a kilopascal is also a very common sort of unit that's used, kilopascal. 
Um, the one that we use the most probably are these three right here. These are the three sort of common ones that we come across a lot. Uh, that is one atmosphere is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury. That's what the MM stands for, millimeters of mercury. And that equals 760 torr. One atmosphere is 101,325 pascals or 101.3 kilopascals. Other units of pressure that you sometimes come across, uh, PSI, right, which is pounds per square inch. Also, uh, bar is another unit of uh, pressure. One atmosphere is like 1.01 bar. They're very close to each other. But really, those three there, the atmospheres, the millimeters of mercury, and our tor are really the three sort of common units that we see a lot. Um, the tor and the millimeters of mercury are, are really kind of based off of uh, this guy right here. This is a good old fashioned barometer, although most of these have been taken out in most chemistry labs at school because they pretty much are a pool of mercury. So not so good to have around and basically a glass column. And as the atmospheric pressure sort of exerts on the pool of mercury, uh, the mercury rises, right, inside the tube. So why do we have this one unit, which is millimeters of mercury? It's for that reason. On a barometer, there's like a ruler. And you basically measure it. And sometimes that ruler is in millimeters. Sometimes that ruler is in inches. Hey, sometimes that ruler is in centimeters. So that's sort of where that unit's name comes from, millimeters, because literally you take a reading in millimeters and it is mercury that's in the column and that's where the millimeters of mercury come from. Tor comes from the guy who invented it, Torricelli invented the barometer. So that is really where that unit comes from. The relationship between those two is one millimeter of mercury is equal to a tor. So one millimeter mercury equals a tor. There are basically a one-to-one -one relationship between those two. And uh, basically you just change the units if you're doing a conversion between them. Obviously, if you're doing conversion between millimeters of mercury, tor, and atmospheres, your 760 number here is an important number. If you have atmospheres and you want millimeters of mercury or tor, you would multiply by the 760. Again, gives you tor are really millimeters of mercury and vice versa. If you obviously have millimeters of mercury or tor, you would divide by the 760 per atmosphere. Gives you atmospheres. So 760, again, is our, our big sort of conversion factor over there to go between our different units. <clears throat> and it, again, is a, a thing that we use a lot in terms of, of sort of uh, conversion of these sort of units here. Any questions on that there? So obviously as well, pressure changes, right? As we get above sea level and stuff like that, as you can see, as we go higher up, our pressure kind of decreases as well. And again, that's why we uh, sort of pressurize airplanes and so forth. Uh, also why pressure does affect things like boiling point and stuff like that. Why you can maybe boil water at a lower temperature, depending on where you're at. Colorado versus here and so forth, depending on sort of the pressure as well. So what we're looking at here are a couple of sort of apparatuses that you can use to measure pressures of gases. And there's a couple of differences between these two monometers here and sort of what's going on and how we measure. One is really a closed system here. So you can kind of see here, there's no opening there. So that's a closed system. And basically we have the gas and inside the column here, we basically have mercury. And obviously as the gas goes, it's got nowhere to go but to fill it up here. And as it fills it up, it's obviously going to move the mercury up the column. 
And you can figure out the pressure of the gas by really measuring the height of the mercury within the column there. And again, that would give you obviously the pressure that's associated with it. Same thing's happening over here, except the top is actually open there and that's more of an open system. So what do we got going on sort of in this case? Well, in this case, we have not only the gas pushing sort of from the front end, but we also have the atmospheric pressure pushing back down on it as well, which can affect obviously the height of the column. And in this case, we would be looking for the pressure of the gas as being equal to the pressure of the height of the column plus the pressure of the uh, sort of atmospheric pressure pushing back down on it, again, giving us that pressure of the gas. Now, again, we could use these guys to study some relationships. And when we talk about gases, there's really sort of uh, three different variables that we deal with a lot when we're dealing with gases. Uh, one is pressure, one is temperature, and one is volume. So when we think about gases, we think about gas laws, we think about really the variables that are sort of there. Again, these are really the three big ones, right? We have our pressure, we have our temperature, and we have our volume. Now, in certain cases, you know, we may keep one constant. So for example, we may keep pressure constant. Uh, in other cases, we may keep temperature constant or volume constant. And it allows us to understand certain relationships. The first relationship we're really gonna look at is one that was looked at by Boyle. And it's what is sometimes referred to as Boyle's law here. And what Boyle looked at was really the relationship between pressure and volume, and he kept temperature constant here. So Boyle looked at the relationship between pressure and volume while keeping temperature constant. And if we just kind of look at our sort of relationship here, let's take a look at sort of the pressure, if you will and the volume relationships in each of these. So volume and pressure, volume and pressure. So in this particular case, we can see that we have the largest volume, but yet we have the smallest pressure. As we go to the sort of opposite extreme, this is our smallest volume, and we see a much larger pressure sort of happening here. And what Boyle was able to really determine was just that. When we look at a gas that's under constant temperature, as the pressure goes up, the volume goes down and vice versa. The pressure goes down, the volume goes up. So why is that happening? So if we think about just logically speaking, if we have gas molecules flying around and we decided we're just gonna lower the volume, right? When we lower that volume in this situation, so say we started with a volume like that, and we decided we got these gas molecules flying around, we then take the volume and squish it down to here. You can see by the picture here that clearly in the smaller volume, that's going to obviously increase the rate of collisions. There's going to be a lot more collisions of the gas molecules basically flying around, hitting the walls of the container and so forth. It's going to take longer, if you will, in this bigger volume for those guys to kind of reach the end or the end of the container and cause collisions to occur. So by lowering that volume, we're increasing the rate of collisions. Since pressure is related to the number of collisions we have, we would expect the pressure to increase in that particular case. Opposite is true as well. If you just look at the picture in sort of the reverse direction, going from here to here, if we suddenly open up the volume, it gives everybody a lot more room to fly around in, in terms of the gas molecules. That's gonna result in less collisions occurring. Less collisions occurring is going to result in the pressure coming down. So by adjusting the volume here, uh, it has a pretty drastic effect, if you will, in terms of the pressure that we associate 
uh, with these gases. Any cast questions on that there? So again, as pressure increases, we expect a much smaller volume. Again, creating that really larger collision that's occurring. And that's what sort of Boyle's Law looks like here in two sort of Boyle's Law graph, pressure versus volume. We see exactly what we talked about at much larger volumes, which is down here. We have a much, if we kind of go across, smaller pressure. If we shrink down that volume to a much smaller volume, we end up with a much higher pressure. And that's the relationship there. It's an inverse relationship. Again, as one goes up, the other goes down. So Boyle's law really is P times V equals a constant. What does that mean? Well, it means if you take a gas and you do a bunch of pressure and volume measurements for that particular gas and you multiply them together, you will get the same number every time. So we take a bunch of readings of pressure times volume, you'll get the, a constant number, sometimes referred to as proportionality constant, sometimes they're abbreviated with a K as well. But basically what that allows us to do is really set two of these conditions equal to each other. It gives us the equation on the bottom, which is really Boyle's law, P1, V1 is equal to P2, V2. Again, here, this is at constant pressure, I'm sorry, constant temperature. Now, what's the deal with the units here? Do you deal with the units is it doesn't really matter. So pressure could really be any unit you like as long as they are both the same. So if you have atmospheres on the left, you should have atmospheres on the right. If you got, you know, sort of uh, millimeters of mercury on the left, you should have that on the right. And volume, same deal. Volume can be really any unit of volume you want as long as they are the same, again, on both sides of that equal sign. <clears throat> Any question on Boyle's law there? All right, so take a moment here and see what you come up with. We have a sample of chlorine gas is, uh, what we got there, 946, at a pressure of 726 millimeters of mercury. What is the pressure of the gas when the volume becomes 154? Take a moment there and see what you come up with good sort of uh, process when you're dealing with gas law problems is, you know, sometimes people have run into a problem as to, I'm not really sure which gas law maybe I should use. So although it's not that hard, I would imagine in this situation, since, you know, we only learned one so far, uh, but a very good sort of approach is really just to take the information out of the problem and sort of label what you got going on there. And oftentimes it could definitely point you in sort of the right direction in terms of, you know, which gas law you should use. So clearly we have a volume that is 946 milliliters. We have a pressure that is 726 millimeters of mercury. We're looking for a pressure and we also have a volume that is 154 milliliters. So, you know, if you just kind of look at it, you could kind of see if you put some numbers in there that looks very much like, again, our Boyle's Law, which is P1V1 equals P2V2. In this case, we're going to be solving for V2, uh, P2. So we're dividing the V2 to the other side. That gives us that P2 is equal to P1V1 divided by V2. In terms of units, we got milliliters on both sides, so we're good. In terms of pressure, we're okay. We could leave it in millimeters of mercury. It just means that obviously we will end up with millimeters of mercury as our unit when we're all done. So P2 would equal 726 millimeters of mercury times 946 milliliters divided by our V2, which is 154 milliliters. Again, the milliliters here will cancel and it looks like uh, 726 times a 946 and divided by a 154. Going to get us, we'll call it 4460 millimeters of mercury.
Any questions on that calculation? So does it make sense sort of our answer? Well, what do we know about Boyle's law? We see here, we started at a volume of 946. Uh, we ended up at a volume of 154. Basically our volume went down, right? So because the volume went down, we would definitely expect our pressure to result in an upwards direction again here, causing more collisions because of that. And we definitely see that, right? We do see 726 where we started, ended up at 4460. So definitely do see the correct sort of adjustment that's happening there in terms of Boyle's law. Question on that. All right, so I want you to give this one a go. 0.55 uh, liters at sea level. If we go to uh, 6.5 kilometers at 0.4, what is the temperature? Uh, I'm sorry, the temperature remains constant. What is the volume of the balloon at that point? Approach here, uh, we're going to kind of go through the question and kind of see what we got going, what we maybe should ignore or not ignore. So uh, we got 0.55, that is definitely a volume. At one atmosphere, that one atmosphere is a pressure. Rises to 6.5 kilometers, that's useless information here. We have another pressure that is 0.4. And we are looking for a volume. So again, you could pretty much see our idea, our idea, we see our Boyle's law here. Again, our P1, V1 equals P2, V2. In this particular case, we are solving for V2. So we're going to basically move this to the other side. And by the way, with all these gas laws, in case uh, rearranging equations uh, is sort of difficult for you, remember that, you know, there's kind of like a, a top there and a bottom, if you will. And basically, if we need to move something to the other side, it always ends up in the opposite locations, right? So that's sort of how it works when you move it. So although this is not really drawn as a fraction, the P really is on top. So when we move it to the other side, it goes to the bottom. And that does give us that V2 is equal to P1, V1 divided by P2. Again, here we want to put our numbers in correctly. You can call the first set of numbers ones, second set twos. That means that V2 is equal to uh, one times 0.5 liters divided by 0 0.4 atmospheres. Atmospheres cancel going to leave us with volume at this point, and we end up uh, with, call it 1.4 liters in this case. Any questions on that calculation there? Does this answer make sense? Well, if we look at our pressure, we started at one atmosphere. We ended up at 0.4 atmospheres. That means the pressure went down, which means the volume should have went up. So it started at 0.55, ended at 1.4. So it definitely did go in the right direction. Any questions on sort of Boyle's law? Okay. So the next uh, sort of guys we're going to look at are a couple of things. We're going to look at the relationship between volume and temperature. Uh, so volume and temperature. Here we would be keeping pressure constant. And that is what is referred to as Charles law. V1 over T1 is equal to V2 over T2. So what do we see here um, at low temperature? 
we actually have a smaller volume, or sorry, a smaller volume there of the gas. At higher temperature, we have a much larger volume of the gas that's there at that higher temperature. So Charles law basically says, as the temperature increases, so does the volume. And as the temperature decreases, so does the volume. And this is at constant pressure. And that does make sense because if you think about another situation, which is sometimes referred to as Guy Lusick's law, that is P1 over T1 is equal to P2 over T2. These are pressures over temperatures, again, like a before and after condition, but this is at constant volume. So what does that mean? It means that we're in a container where we got kind of a rigid top there. It's not gonna go anywhere. So what happens when we raise the temperature in this situation? Well, if the temperature increases, we would imagine that the gas molecules would start flying around a lot faster. They obviously would gain a lot of energy. And because the volume won't move, that means that they essentially have nowhere to go. They got to hit the container, right? They're going to have to its container and so forth. And because of that, we would expect an increase in the pressure to occur because of the increase in collisions. So as the temperature goes up in Guy Lussac's law, the pressure would also go up and vice versa. If the temperature goes down, the pressure would also go down. Again, in that situation here, we have that fixed sort of top. If we lower the temperature, these gas molecules are gonna be moving slower. It's gonna take longer for collisions basically to occur. And because of that, we do see a drop in uh, the pressure. Now that's different in our Charles law situation. What we're trying to do in Charles law is actually keep the pressure constant. So we can do that by adjusting the volume. So what happens is if we have a container of a gas and we increase the temperature, if we didn't move the volume like we did over here, we definitely would see that pressure increase. But because we wanna keep it at constant pressure, the volume itself will actually increase, allowing those gas molecules, basically the more room that they need to maintain the pressure and keep it sort of constant. So that is sort of our relationship there. Charles law, constant pressure, volume over temperature, Guy Lussac's law, constant volume, pressure over temperature. The relationship of both of those is basically as one goes up, the other goes up. And as one goes down, the other goes down accordingly to each other. Any questions on that? So if you actually do a, a Charles law and sort of a Guy Lussac's law sort of plot, and you can take any gas you like, basically, and plot it with volume versus temperature in degrees Celsius. And if you extrapolate that line all the way back to the Y, I'm sorry, to the X axis, it will always hit, no matter what gas it is, always the same location it will always hit this number, which is minus 273.15 degrees Celsius. You may remember that number. That number looks very much like how we convert things into Kelvin. We take the temperature in Celsius and add 273.15, although we don't usually use the 0.15. That means that, hey, if we... Uh, convert this into Kelvin, we would add 273.15, which would give us zero Kelvin, which is referred to as absolute zero. Obviously recognized by our good friend Kelvin here, yeah. So what does that have to do with sort of gas laws and stuff like that? Well, 
what it has to do with gas laws is when we take a gas law, like we just saw there, Charles law, V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2, the temperature needs to be in Kelvin. In fact, you could make it a pretty safe bet that if you are doing something with a gas law and you have a temperature and you wanna get the right answer, you should definitely convert it into Kelvin for sure. Otherwise, again, you'll get the wrong answer. So it definitely has to be in Kelvin, both of these temperatures for you to get the right answer. Also Guy Lussac's law needs to be in Kelvin as well. So these guys do need to be in Kelvin. In terms of the pressure, in terms of the volume, it can really be any unit you want for volume as long again, they are both the same. And as long as the pressures are both the same on both sides, you will be okay in terms of that. Any questions on that there? I will also extend that pretty much to any gas law. So if you're doing anything with gas laws that involves temperature, you should definitely convert it to Kelvin. Otherwise it will definitely be most likely wrong. Now, even in a problem that always gets people where the problem goes, our temperature is this much degrees Celsius. What is the new temperature in degrees Celsius? So people go, well, they gave it to me in degrees Celsius. They want the answer in degrees Celsius. I don't need to convert it. And the answer is you do need to convert it if you want to get it right. So in this type of problem, you would need to take it to Kelvin. You then we need to put it into the gas law and then you would need to convert it back to Celsius. So again, that's a very common sort of question sometimes asked, you know, in a gas chapter and it's oftentimes missed by people because, which is a logical assumption, you know, they're like, hey, they gave it to me in Celsius. They want the answer in Celsius. It seems logical. You know, I could slap it into that gas law in Celsius, uh, but it really doesn't work out right. So you do need to convert it to Kelvin and then go backwards and obviously get it back to the unit you're looking for. Any questions on that there? All right. So why don't you take a second here? We have a carbon monoxide occupies 3.2 liters at 125 degrees Celsius. What temperature will it occupy at 1.54 liters if the pressure remains constant? So see what you come up with. That we've been talking about we're going to pull out the info here and see what we got going uh we obviously got 3.2 liters that should be a volume we have 125 degrees celsius that is definitely a temperature at uh, what temperature so we're looking for a temperature would the volume end up at uh 1.54 again if you had to choose between now or three different gas laws Really, Charles Law should really be sort of sticking out to you if you kind of do that. You know, that's almost exactly Charles Law. In this case, we are solving, I get that right. We are solving for uh, T2 in this case. So, again, as I talked about, if you want to kind of easily manipulate these equations, kind of the swap places move. So I want T2 to go to the other side. So he's going to end up on top. This guy needs to go that way. And then the V2 needs to go that way, basically. And if you do a bunch of that rearranging, you end up with uh, T2 is equal to uh, V2 times T1 divided by V1. And what we're basically doing is multiplying the T2 to both sides. We're then dividing by V1 and times in by T1 to the other sides. Again, these guys cancel, leaves us V2, T1, V1. And obviously these guys cancel here and these guys cancel here. So that's basically what we're doing is multiplying then dividing. We also wanna make sure that we do put things in sort of the right spot. In terms of units, we have liters on both of those guys, so they're good. But as our conversation there about Kelvin, 
that guy being not so good. So we do need to add 273 to that. So 273 plus a 120 gives us 393 in terms of the temperature. We'll go that way with it. Plus a 273. Going to give us a 393 Kelvin. All right. So uh, plopping our numbers in here. Looks like V2. Want to make sure I get that in the right spot. 1.54 liters. T1 converted to Kelvin divided by V1 in this case, 3.2 liters. Liters going to cancel, going to leave us Kelvin, which is good because we are looking for a temperature. And we will end up uh, with, <laughs> there we go, let me see here, 1.5. I think I wrote that wrong. That should be eight, I think, right? Yeah, there you go. So that should be eight. And uh, no, it is uh, 125. Thank you. That is by, I was off there. Thank you. It's close, I suppose. A zero looks like a five, I suppose. All right, so now I think I got everybody there correct. Let's try that again. All right, so uh, obviously that then becomes eight. Thank you. Uh, 1.54 times 398 divided by 3.2 gives us a 192 here in terms of temperature in Kelvin. We then actually would, if we wanted it in Celsius, it didn't actually say it, but if we wanted it in Celsius, we would subtract 273 from it. We actually would get a negative number in this particular case. Uh, and that's about negative 81.5 degrees Celsius. Didn't really specify, I don't think, what temperature we're looking at, but there we go. Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, questions on that calculation there? Now, did we see uh, what we expected to see? Well, in this case, the volume went from 3.2 to 1.5. So the volume went down, which means because this is Charles Law, we would anticipate that the temperature also went down as well. And it definitely did. It went from 125 here uh, down to minus 81.5, which definitely is lower. Questions on that there? All right, let's try another one here. Get it here. here we go. All right, so this one goes to come up with an experiment. We got 452 milliliters of a gas in a light bulb. Goes from 22 to 187. Uh, what is the final volume? We got a temperature that is 22 degrees Celsius. It then goes to 187. And we're looking for the volume here. Again, it's pretty clear just by putting in sort of uh, the values and the letters there that, you know, again, we're dealing with our Charles Law here. Just like before, we do need to do some conversions here. We want to get our temperatures there into uh, Kelvin. 187 plus 273 gets you a 460 Kelvin. A 22 plus 273 gets you a 295 Kelvin. And again, our milliliters are okay in this case. It uh, just means that when we get the answer, we will be in milliliters. We're going to solve for V2, which means we just simply need to move that guy to the top. And that would get us uh, V2 is equal to T2, V1, T1 as that goes to the other side and uh, putting our values in the right spots, V1 being 452, T2, which would go on top, 460, divided by 295 Kelvin. Again, here, our Kelvins are going to cancel out, getting us 452 times 460 divided by 295. Gets us something like 705, milliliters. Again, if we sort of check to make sure we didn't mess up anywhere, we see again that the temperature went from 22 to 187. So that definitely is an increase in temperature, 
which means we would expect an increase in volume. So we went for 452 to 750 or 705. Um, so that definitely is an increase. So again, we could kind of double check our calculation just to make sure, you know, it makes sense based off of sort of the gas law. Any questions on any part of that calculation? All right, one more example here. Argon inert gas and light bulbs, uh, circa one is containing uh, 1.2 atmospheres at 18 degrees and 85 uh, degrees Celsius. What is the final pressure at constant volume? So see what you come up with on this one. Same steps here. In this case, we actually have a pressure of 1.2 atmospheres. That has a temperature associated with 18 degrees Celsius. Uh, we're obviously taking it now to 85 degrees Celsius and we're looking for a pressure. So again, if you look at this, in this case, this kind of eliminates Charles Law as there's no volume. Also eliminates Boyle's Law as there's no volume. So here we will be looking at our guy Lusick's Law, which is P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. Just like any gas law, we got to get these guys into Kelvin. So we're going to add 273 right away here uh, to make sure we don't forget to do that. And that's going to give us a 291 Kelvin on the left and a 358 Kelvin on the right. Pressures in atmospheres, which means again here, if I learned the count, those would be twos. Uh, we are going to be solving for P2 here, going to be moving our T2 to the other side, and that will get us P2 is equal to P1, T2, and T1. Popping in our numbers here in the right spots, I'm going to hope for the best 1.2 atmospheres. Uh, T2 looking like a 358 Kelvin all divided there by our 291 Kelvin. Here the Kelvins do cancel, leaves us atmospheres as our unit, which is good because uh, we're looking for a pressure and looks like we do end up uh, with, uh, definitely not that number, 1.48 atmospheres. It helps if you punch the number in, right? 1.48 atmospheres. Any questions on that calculation there? So what did we see? Again, if you remember Guy Lusick's sort of relationship, pressure goes up, so does the temperature. Pressure goes down, so does the temperature. Temperature here went up, which means we would expect the pressure to go up. Started at 1.20, 1 ended at 1.48 so that is an increase in the pressure which is again what we would expect to happen based on sort of the conditions that are occurring here any questions on that there all right so we now got a few gas laws under our belts let's continue on to our good friend Avogadro yes he had a number but you know he felt like he should have a gas law too so why not really so when we think about Avogadro, right, what do we typically think about with Avogadro? We think about Avogadro's number. Avogadro's number is 6.022 times 10 to the 23 atoms, uh, molecules equals one mole. So when we think about Avogadro's law, it was not hard to imagine that it also involves moles. And sort of the formula version of Avogadro's law is what we see down there. It is V1 over N1 is equal to V2 over N2. And this is at two types of conditions. This is at constant temperature and pressure. So two sort of constant values at this case. Uh, N here is the number of moles. So N is basically the number of moles. V is volume. Again, can be any unit you like on either side there. It's all good. One of the relationships that actually develops out of this is 
what we see with Avogadro's law is the volume is proportional to the number of moles. So essentially, as the volume increases, so does the moles of the gas and vice versa. And one sort of consequence of this is in addition to just regularly plugging and chugging into your Avogadro's law there in the top right corner or even the bottom left there, um, we can actually use it as a stoichiometry sort of relationship as well. Because the volume and the moles are sort of proportional to each other, if you happen to have a reaction that is going on that's involving gases and it's done at constant temperature and pressure, you can basically relate what we do with stoichiometry in the mole to mole relationship into a volume to volume relationship. And what I mean by that, if we look at this reaction on the bottom, what we see here is if we did our kind of normal stoichiometry relationship, we would say three moles of H2 equals one mole of N2. We could also say three moles of H2 produce two moles of NH3. We could say one mole of N2 gets us uh, two moles of NH3, right? And that's just our stoichiometry here. If we were to do this at constant temperature and pressure, we could actually come up with the same relationships but basically turn them into volumes. We could say, for example, that for every three liters of H2 you toss in there, you're gonna to toss in there one liter of N2. For every three liters of H2 you toss in there, I'm sure why the two is so far away, you get two liters of NH3 out. And lastly, for every uh, one liter of N2 you put in there, you get two liters of NH3 out. You could again use these just like a conversion factor, just like a mole to mole conversion factor. You know. So you can definitely use them as sort of, just like we do sort of a basic stoichiometry problem. And sometimes it's helpful and especially it prevents you from maybe sometimes having to use a gas law to solve sort of a gas stoichiometry problem. So just to kind of show you how one of those would work, let's take a look at this. If ammonia burns in, oops, don't drop it, there we go. If ammonia burns in oxygen to form nitric oxide, how many volumes of NO, so we're interested in how much of this guy, are obtained from one volume of this guy. So it is at constant temperature, it is at constant pressure. So we really can look at this equation and go, all right, then four liters of NH3 give us five liters of O2. We can all say four liters of NH3 gives us four liters of NO in this particular case. We could also do the rest of the sort of conversions, but this is really the one that we need in this particular problem. From that, again, we can basically get two conversion factors, four liters of NH3 up on top, four liters of NO on the bottom, or we could do four liters of NO up on top and four liters of NH3 on the bottom. So if we just make our one volume here, one liter of NH4. So if we started with one liter of NH3, we would do just like a mole to mole relationship here. We would want the NH3 to cancel. So we would use this as our conversion factor. Four liters of NO gives us four liters of NH3, which means we end up with one liter of NO. It is basically a one-to-one -one relationship in terms of the moles and also a one-to-one -one relationship in terms of the volume. So this is a nice little stoichiometry way for uh, gas stoichiometry. And again, this is a case where you might not have to actually use, you know, an actual gas law to solve it. Question on that. Again, the important part of that is it does definitely need to be 
constant temperature and pressure for you to basically use Avogadro's relationship here. If it is not, then obviously you cannot use it. Any questions on that? So looking at some of our relationships that we talked about here, Boyle's law, again, as one goes up, the other goes down. So as the volume goes up, the pressure goes down. As the pressure goes up, the volume goes down. Looking at our sort of Charles law and Guy Lussac's law, again, as the pressure goes up, so does the temperature. And as the pressure goes down, so does the temperature as well. And again, the volume as well will increase as the temperature increases and the volume will decrease as the temperature decreases in that constant pressure situation. Putting that together with sort of Avogadro's law involving the volumes and the moles, we could basically put together all of those previous gas laws into really the granddaddy of them all one we're all here for really. This is the ideal gas law, which is PV equals NRT. So PV equals NRT is the ideal gas law. It obviously describes a ideal gas. And basically most of the gases we deal with under normal circumstances, we again basically feel that they're ideal. And the two parts that sort of make a gas ideal, I sort of mentioned a little bit earlier today, and one of them is uh, we assume that there is no really attractive force between different gas molecules. And what that means is even if we have multiple gas molecules in the same container, we almost assume in an ideal situation that they're kind of like they're by themselves. They're not really interacting with each other uh, they're not affecting the pressure of one versus the other in that sense. So that's sort of an ideal situation. The second part of that is the volume of an ideal gas is really small. Compared to the container it's in. And if you think about a lot of gas law problems that we've seen or will see, a lot of times we don't really talk necessarily about the volume of the gas itself. We basically talk about the idea of the volume of the container with which it is in. And that's sort of what an ideal gas is, is taking really those two things sort of into consideration. And we get this ideal gas law. First major difference about the ideal gas law is it is not like a before and after situation like the ones we've seen up to this point. There's not like two pressures, two volumes, two temperatures. It's like a one and done situation happening here, one of each of these things. The other really important thing about the ideal gas law is it is the most restrictive in terms of units. When you use ideal gas law, your pressure has to be in atmospheres. Your volume has to be in liters and has to be in moles and T has to be in Kelvin. The reason why all those guys really need to be in those units is because of R. R is the gas constant. It has a value of 0 0.08206, and it has units of liters times atmospheres divided by Kelvin times mole. So if you're ever not sure what things should be in terms of units, you could actually find them right there. Gives you pretty much the units of everybody else that needs to be there. Sometimes people will round this number to 0 0.0821, that's okay. I personally use this one most of the time because that's what they beat in my head and I can't get it out. But uh, you know, some people do round to 0 0.0821. And again, that is essentially the units uh, that we use for that. And again, why? Uh, pretty much everybody else needs to be sort of in those units. Any questions on that there? All right, we will uh, lay it up right there.